Hello, you're all very welcome. I'm Chris Flynn, the CEO of the Discovery Programme. Uh, the Discovery Programme is an all-island centre for archaeology and heritage science. What we do is improve the understanding of Ireland's past, primarily through the interpretation of its archaeological record, and the communication of that improved understanding to as wide an audience as possible. The Discovery Programme Board is concentrating on some key areas to ensure we deliver these objectives. We provide research leadership by working with the archaeological community to develop a research framework for archaeology on an Ireland-wide basis. And we will support the research community by contributing to policy making and, crucially, deliver a range of public engagement activities aimed at the general public. One of these activities would be the presentation of online lectures or webinars. And today I'm pleased to say we'll see the first of these from Dr. Neil Brady. Discovery Programme is committed to realizing the potential of projects like the Medieval World Settlement Project, the research for which was initiated in 2002, and from which the publication, Dublin Region in the Middle Ages, by Dr. Michael Potterton, Dr. Margaret Murphy was produced. Next volume. The Castlemore module, on which Dr. Neil Brady's talk is based, is also an exciting part of that project and is being completed for publication later this year. I'm sure many of you would have questions for Dr. Brady, so can I suggest that you type in any questions in the Q&A box in the webinar, and Dr. Brady will deal with them at the end. And now, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Neil Brady to you and to hear from him about Castlemore. Thank you. Chris, uh, good evening. And um, to the many people um, who I believe are out there, hello. Um, this is an exciting moment uh, from, I suppose, many perspectives. Um, one of which is to have the opportunity to talk to you this evening about Castlemore but also to be able to talk to you in our new um, curious moment um, by way of uh, through my laptop, most curious indeed. So you will forgive me if there are some coughs and splutters and whatever else may go wrong um, during this. Uh, I can't see you or I can't hear you, so for those of you who are used to hearing me present, this is uh, <laughs> quite a strange environment, but um, hopefully you will uh, enjoy it as much as I will enjoy uh, presenting it. I'm sharing my screen and I'm hoping you can see that. Um, why are where we in Castlemore, I suppose, is the question we can begin with. And, and I'm hoping to present a summary of our work in about 20, 25 minutes and look forward to your uh, conversation with you af after that. Castlemore um, presents itself today as a typical deserted settlement, a deserted medieval village. Um, in many respects. And while there are some very significant DMVs or deserted settlements in Ireland, most notably Newtown Jerpoint in, in County Kilkenny with its very present and upstanding earthworks, uh, there are many others uh, around the country for which there are very few standing remains. And Castlemore is a good example of that. There is a fine but heavily overgrown mott. Um, its attendant bailey is quite reduced. And there is a small churchyard to the south. But the, even the churchyard is quite reduced and eroded. Um, David Sweetman was there, I think, in the 1980s. Uh, David, if you're listening, you probably correct me. Uh, but he was picking up some pottery from the Bailey area and it became registered in the National Museum. 
So Castlemore presented itself as an example of a deserted settlement, of an example of a medieval manor that we could perhaps, within the medieval rural settlement project of the Discovery Programme, within which we're, where we could perhaps um, examine the deserted site in greater detail and discover what more uh, may emerge. We were very keen not to do any excavation. This was a, a program that would fit in within the wider um, orbit of the medieval rural settlement project, which had a number of modules. Chris has identified the first module, the publication of the Dublin region, based effectively on a desktop study, uh, the gleaning of information, establishing baseline, presenting the essential arguments without even fieldwork. Um, both from the archaeological side and, and, and uh, Margaret Murphy's work on the uh, written sources. At Castlemore, we wanted to take the step further by combining archival research with archaeological fieldwork, but with no, without excavation. And our final area, the two modules in Ross Common, which is where we ended up digging and, 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 and getting I suppose, a, a staged approach to the wonderful world of the medieval countryside. Castlemore, perhaps somewhat uniquely in Ireland, is also gifted by the survival of a series of manorial and, and rural borough accounts of the late 1200s. Uh, so you have this sequence of essentially eight years in the 1280s uh, where it's possible to look at what has been grown on the manor, uh, what is being uh, achieved in the town, the associated town, and to see this in a, over, over the period of a decade. In Ireland this is relatively unique because our records uh, haven't survived. In England of course this is typical. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a common occurrence, but in Ireland it's not. So we were interested to, to use these two prongs of approach, these uh, archival research and also archeological research uh, and, and combine them. And Margaret, Margaret Murphy has been working uh, on the documentary side and um, also helping us with the field walking. And what do we know about Castle Moor? Well, Castlemore, we feel, is associated with the manor of Forth, or Fotherhood, um, as it was known in, in the 12th and 13th century. Uh, Fotherhood itself is the name that's given to a, a cantred, and before that, to a, a trica ced, or a, a, a pre-existing Irish territorial unit. Um, and while Adrian Empey might disagree with the association of Forth with Castle Moor, we feel the, the evidence is overwhelmingly in support of that association. And we know that in 1174, the cantred of Forth was granted to Raymond Le Gros. Raymond was one of the great barons of the Anglo-Norman barons who landed with the initial parties of, of uh, Cambro Normans into Wexford, and the uh, the wonderful song of Dermot and the Earl, um, the, uh, the the chronicle of the Anglo Norman conquest, initial conquest, shows Raymond in all his glory. He's described by Gerald of Wales as a slightly portly person, but that doesn't quite come across in this image that is supposedly of Raymond in the National Library on your, on your screen. In 1181, a magnificent earthen moss castle is built for Raymond at what becomes Castle Moor. And here we have a, a picture from the Cambridge collection um, showing the, the moss. Uh, um, and in many respects, it hasn't changed in the, now the 21st century. 
uh, we have this uh, heavily overgrown um, site amidst a heavily cultivated landscape. And it was the, the fact that the fields either side of the moss are cultivated, regularly being cultivated, so the topsoil is being exposed, that attracted us uh, even more to the site because we were interested in the process of field walking. Uh, to give you some sense of the geography, the wider landscape, uh, Castle Moor is... Uh, my cursor, you've got to follow my cursor, and I've got to get myself off the screen here in order to do that. Yes, there's Tullo, uh, the village of Tullo and Carlo, the River Slaney, and Castle Moor is just a little uh, three kilometres to the west of it. Uh, beside at this crossroads of Lamina. And 13 kilometres to the west again is the town of Carlo. And the River Barrow flowing down from Carlo, River Slaney flowing through Tullow, and in between them the Burren River. Um, uh, these are important uh, topographical features that help to explain, I believe, why we uh, uh, have this. Um, collection of, of monuments and, and, and uh, 12th century interest in, in, in what is a very fertile uh, interfluve region between um, the Barrow and the Slaney, uh, each of them nestled by various uplands. Um, to the west of the Barrow you have the Castle Comer Plateau and to the east of the Slaney you have the Wicklow effectively the Wicklow Mountains and the Black Stairs to the south. So there's a topographic rationale here. And if you extend out from that uh, even further, uh, again, I'll use my cursor, here we are in Tullow, uh, Castle Moor is, is in, in this central area. And then to the east, you see the enveloping area of the Wicklows and to the west, the Castle Comer Plateau. And these are these are important topographical factors that play a part when you trace the archaeological narrative of this landscape through the ages. Uh, to the southwest, you have, it doesn't quite show in this uh, Discovery Series maps, but you have a low ridge called the Nerny Ridge. And this is also uh, a feature that, the, uh, that comes across when you plot the landscape. There's an ancient roadway that runs through this landscape, and it's the Schlea Cullen, uh, which ran from Waterford in the south to Dublin in the north, using the route north of Tullow along what is today's N81, and crossing between the Slaney and the Barrow right south of Castle Moor, along what is now this little narrow third-class road that crosses the Nerny Ridge. Again, when you plot the archaeological um, monuments and sites that uh, in the wider area, you, one sees an interesting association with both the rivers and the Schlea. And I don't think these are coincidental at all. These are um, quite uh, purposefully presented. Now, you must forgive my maps. Um, but th this map here is showing the modern county boundary of Carlo. The modern county of Carlo is a smaller entity to the medieval county. The medieval county extended to the uh, northwest, um, up the Barrow Valley, um, and into uh, almost reaching Dunamis, and it also extended uh, northeast into Wicklow into the Shillelagh area, but not as far as, as Baltingfast. In the south, um, in what is modern-day Kilkenny, you also had the extension of um, the medieval county along the uh, west side of the, of the Barrow Valley. And what I've plotted here, uh, perhaps somewhat cheekily, uh, is what I would suggest is a representation of the 12th century land. In, in, in doing so, I'm in, including the early medieval ecclesiastical sites, uh, sites with high crosses. Um, I'm also including multivalent ring forts and raised ring forts. 
as a view with a with a view to sort of suggesting where the power centers lay um, in the early period and then with the uh, the purple or the magenta color here you have the mountain baileys um, there are no ringworks at the time so these are the earliest um, fortifications that we traditionally associate with uh, the high medieval uh, settlement um, and I suppose I come from the school of seeing a, a, a good level of interaction and transition between what existed in the landscape before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans and, uh, and, and what they uh, tend to build. And what one might see here is that uh, Castle Moor is associated with a little enclave of Mott and Mott and Bailey sites, all at the northern part of the county. What this map doesn't show you is the fact that this is also perhaps the richest land in the county. Uh, this, is, this is very fertile land today, as it was in the past, and I think this helps to explain the concentration of, of sites. You also see um, a, a, a confluence of sites or congregation of sites along the river valleys, um, whereas here this uh, line of moths uh, in uh, eastern Kilkenny effectively are tracing up the side of the Castlecomer plateau and that really is I suppose speaks to the narrative of the mott in this instance uh, uh, as a frontier uh, fortification hemming in the unruly Osriga and other um, uh, contenders uh, who are resisting um, both Dermot McMurrah uh, and his, his uh, claims for reclaiming the, the Lordship of Leinster, but also uh, um, the Earl of Pembroke and his forces. We can look at um, later maps as well to give us a sense of the historic landscape, albeit these are several centuries later and one must allow for that, but it shows you um, here we are uh, in the Castle Moor zone to the south, in the Barony or the Cantred of Forth, it's a reduced um, in, this, in the 1600s in the Dan Survey, but you see the very southern area, you've got the Black Stairs and a lot of woodland, and that helps to explain the lack of settlement, whether it's early medieval or later medieval settlement in the south of, of the Barony, and, and extending across um, westwards into Idrone or Odrone, uh, you have the Nerny Ridge on the one hand, and you have the very defined boundary uh, of uh, the, the Burren River, um, defining the the um, the, uh, the Barney at this at this point. Um, today, the river is perhaps a trickle. We'd see it as a trickle, but in historic times, rivers, no matter how small, have uh, important roles. Uh, uh, and we must be aware of. And then the uh, western boundary of the being the River Barrow itself. If we're extending that um, observation of settlement, going into the, going through the high medieval period, we may include additional sites. We have our moated sites, we have our, our masonry castles, we have our um, later medieval religious houses and that I suppose in many respects the distribution fulfills the the models that we've come to anticipate associated with this period. So the moated sites are supposedly uh, later settlement into the in, in, away from the core areas as the sites uh, develop. We have our DMVs, our manorial villages associated with um, uh, caputs uh, uh, and so on. And correspondingly, we get a sense of the lineage of the, the transition of land ownership through the period. Raymond Le Gros, a great master and commander that he was, dies without producing a male heir and his, his lands revert to the marshals um, who had taken over the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Lordship of Leinster in this section 
from Strongbow. Marshall himself uh, dies without producing a male heir. Uh, and in 1247, because he has no male heirs, the, his, the lordship is divided amongst Marshall's daughters and their offsprings. And one of those, and the, the, the lordship is divided into, into uh, five equal parts. Uh, and one of the daughters, Matilda, receives Carlo, uh, the manor of Bally Sachs in Kildare, as well as properties in Wexford. And it's this, it's this, um, this unit, this fifth, that is of interest to us because Matilda dies uh, a year later and her son, Roger Bigod, the Earl of Norfolk, receives her estate. And it's under the Bigod's um, authority or presence that we see uh, the estate grow in the uh, late 13th century or what we might uh, see from a economic historian's perspective, the period of high farming, which is this moment of burgeoning economic prosperity across the medieval West that's in tune with a, a climatic optimum on, on the one hand. Um, you see uh, in Ireland a great shift towards arable production and um, in a sense, it, it, it is the moment of the great adventure before the, the trials of the 14th century when everything goes to pot, effectively. Um, I like to see this as the Wheel of Fortune um, doing her thing in, in the ascendant, uh, but that all, that all comes to change. What Margaret is working on are the uh, accounts, both the borough accounts, Forth is a, a, a town, a rural borough, um, and uh, it, the manorial accounts, the, the accounts of the, the, uh, the Lord's domain itself. And we see from that a good, um, we, we receive from that a good perspective on how, uh, of the busyness of, of this small entity today. Um, we see that, for instance, the borough uh, boasted 80 burgage holders and 29 cottagers. So you've got 80 effective, effectively 80 townspeople who are not necessarily working the settlement as a town, but they are, um, they are active uh, agrarian people. They're active farmers in a sense. And 12, 29 cottagers who would be perhaps the, the base labour to support a lot of that. Um, after Roger the Fourth, uh, Bigod, Roger, Roger the Fourth Bigod dies in 1306. There's a, an inventory drawn up of his assets, and we see re relatively similar numbers: 73 burgage holders um, and 29 cottagers. Um, you have information in relation to different assets, uh, of which I've just chosen one here, being the smithy. Um, if Pat Wallace is listening, it may interest Pat. Uh, in, and this contrasts, I suppose, with the, the accounts earlier in the 1285-86, when the income from the manor can be uh, recorded, not judged, but recorded as being 88 pounds or thereabouts, and the expenses, uh, the outgoings, what, what it costs to produce, uh, what it costs to invest in building maintenance, what it costs in, in relation to uh, other payments out of £31, giving a pretty healthy profit of the order of £55. Now, £55 in the 13th century is a considerable amount of money when you, when you um, I suppose, associate the labour, labourer's wage, the daily for labour would be in the or, order of three pennies. Um, so an annual profit in the order of £55 is really quite, um, quite healthy. In 1306, the estate is quite run down, um, or it's recorded as being run down. Of course, one must also, uh, while one, um, I suppose, why one is conscious of the, the pending doom and gloom of the 14th century, 
I'd also be conscious that these in, uh, inquisitions post-mortem, these inventories drawn up on, at the death of uh, a, a, a person are also a testimony to the crown, to the king, of the assets he has at his disposals, at his disposal. So perhaps one isn't being altogether truthful about the wealth that's in the manor. Um, it's always human to, uh, I suppose, downplay one's assets where, where possible because you don't want the tax man knowing too much, surely. That said, uh, the historical sources do uh, indicate uh, uh, an estate uh, and a manor and, and Bigot's wider estate being being pretty run down. The main residence of the Lord at Forth was in disrepair, the chamber of stone and lath roof of planks, and a grange or barn made of ten weak forks. Now, ten weak forks um, would suggest uh, a barn or grandia of maybe eleven bays, uh, and the forks or the furka are usually interpreted as um, uh, the the over the crooks that would be uh, that would use, serve both to divide the interior of the barn into bays, but also to support the roof. So, from an archaeological perspective, such a um, uh, such detail is of interest, and uh, we can also look to see whereabouts on the wider domain the 18 score and eight acres um, uh, were located. Um, very frustrating, of course, because uh, place names change over time and we don't necessarily see these things. But they're, all, they're thrilling um, tidbits of useful information to be, to be working with. So we have all this information, wonderful uh, historical sources, really nice uh, series of monuments distributed around a rich topographical landscape. How do we find the detail? Because you're presented with this, uh, you take the mosh out of the equation, you take the um, ruined graveyard out of the equation, this is your landscape. Cornfields, uh, or barley fields, um, and how do you find them and what do you do with it? That's really where we started from in uh, the Medieval Rural Settlement Project, where we decided we would do as much as we could without putting a trowel in the ground. A trowel not raised in anger. It's great fun. So Rob and Anthony and Gary got together to strip away the, uh, the foliage, the um, the trees, the vegetation on the mott to, by way of laser scanning, obviously um, not physical removal of anything, to create um, a, a, a terrain model, a digital model of the mott in its setting. And from that, we can add additional layers. Unfortunately, the mott itself, the top of the mott is just riddled with uh, uh, animal burrows, badgers and various beasties have been burrowing into it over the years, in addition to the trees and their roots. So um, it, 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 is, it would be quite a trial to expect to find too much um, if you were to wield a trowel up there. But uh, you can ascertain a fair amount of information uh, by a uh, careful topographical study uh, survey in this, in this manner. The rest of us, what did we do? Well, we went walking. We went. We waited for the flower, the fields either side of the mot to be uh, ploughed. And um, despite the rather nice picture, I do remember two seasons in March of about four days each, and it was nothing but sleeting rain the whole time, because it's just a very limited moment between the fields being under crop. And then ready for 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 uh, for the new sowing, and one can't go in immediately after the ploughing because the clods are too big; they have to be reduced in tilth. So you have to let it, ideally a bit of frost to get in there and work it, its magic. But you have this moment uh, where one can 
go in and and walk and that's what we did we walked and then we walked some more and then we walked even more and we plotted everything uh, we got x y and z coordinates for every tiny little artifact and we had a, a, a good friend of ours working with us from um, from Hungary, uh, Edith Sorosi, who came over to look at what we were up to, and she was uh, uh, quite astounded by what we were picking up, because of course, continental Europe and indeed England has a wonderfully rich medieval pottery ceramic tradition, and they they only count the uh, the rims. Whereas we were picking up the smallest, the tiniest of artifacts that we could find to build up a picture of um, uh, a distribution picture of what, uh, what's there. And we were quite astounded. I mean, David found a, a, a couple of sherds in the Bailey area back in the 70s, but we collected over 2,000 artifacts from the fields either side of the Mott. There was no other fields available um, under the cultivation. So this was just really in two, in two small fields. And within that assemblage, a fierce amount of Leinster cooking ware, which is precisely the period of the late 1200s when we have all that information in the account. So there's wonderful overlap. Now there's a lot of other stuff there as well. There was modern nonsense. Um, and there was also a lot of uh, post-medieval pottery. So what we, uh, what we got was a really nice assemblage, again, without putting a trowel in the ground. And, and to people who, who um, well, how should I say this? I think there's great merit in retaining the archeology span of the plough zone. Um, we perhaps don't give enough merit to the, uh, the locational information of objects in the plough zone. We may feel perhaps that they are all disarticulated and it's not really of any great use. It's night soil after all. It's just, you know, redeposited crap, basically. Um, we felt differently. And so, and this is really what lay behind our uh, approach, our methodology of plotting everything. And we, did, we created a very, well, we didn't create, the, the distribution that came out was, was very linear. And so we decided um, the next phase of the operation would be to undertake some geophysical survey. And Paul Gibson from NUI Maynooth came to our rescue and subsequently John Nichols of Target Archaeological Geophysics. And between them, they captured what can only be described for, again, this is 2004, 2005. It really was quite uh, uh, fantastic. Um, to see the quality of this information being generated uh, from a quiet arable countryside. There's no road going through there, uh, no modern road development. Uh, there's no reason for anybody to take any uh, impact action in, in, in this location. So it, this, was a, um, this was just, this was very nice. The road that you see here uh, is the modern road uh, cutting right beside the, the mott. And what we, what we uh, realized very quickly was the modern road is on the track of the main street of the medieval, of, of the manor. Here you see uh, to the east and north of the road, these long dark strips. These are the classic property boundaries. And within those you see individual houses and, and, and plots and a similar assemblage of features to, to the south of the road, at the west of the road, and this great big D-shape bailey. Uh, you, there's, it's not that striking above the ground today because it's so eroded and so denuded, but once you look at the geophysics, the gradiometry data, it's just very, very striking. And within that then you have a whole series of features. Now what date all these features are, um, obviously we're not excavating, so that level of, of um, observation uh, must lie outside our, our survey. 
what we did was then we extended the survey footprint. And what we feel now is we've captured the entirety of the main settlement associated with Castlemore Forth. And what I would see here is the, uh, the footprint of a classic street village. If you were in England, you'd be calling them a street village. These planned settlements uh, um, laid out as part of the uh, high medieval expansion of settlement associated with Normans, Anglo-Normans, Cambro-Normans, whatever you want to call them, um, as they roll out across the medieval West. But of course, it's a street village on one level, but it's more than that. It's, it's quintessentially uh, unique uh, because you have, for instance, this boundary, this long curving uh, boundary, what's creating that curvature, this, this terminus at this point? These are questions we don't necessarily have uh, strong answers or, or firm answers for, but we, we plot and we notice these things. The, the presence of, of modern buildings and houses and homes, of course, confuses and, and constrains the archaeological approach, but um, there's a lot going on here. And I'd want to lead you through some of this um, uh, in this brief overview. Um, again, just going into the individual house uh, or property boundaries, you see uh, this, this wonderful property boundary coming up. Within that house, uh, little rectangular house, gable set onto the road, so you've got issues of space constraint. Um, underlying these houses, then you've got other linear property boundaries. So you're getting a sense that this is a this is a village that perhaps had several phases of, of building and, and rebuilding. You have curious little circular features, perhaps cesspits, uh, garden features in, in the rear, uh, rear of these buildings. So there's a lot going on. Um, and again, going to that terminal, that curving terminal feature in the north, um, in the north of, of, of the settlement area, uh, lots to be playing with. Uh, you also have, I think, clearly some evidence of earlier features that predate the uh, high medieval settlement here. You have a really clear signature for what must be a little barrel there and also up here a little barrel. And this, I suppose, allows us to open up the question that I find very intriguing and interesting is what was here before? What, what, how is it that these uh, manors are allowed, permitted? How do they get to be located where they are? I think this is a really important question. And I think Castlemore may have uh, an explanation, at least for this site. Um, and I, this is where I, I'm, I'm coming close to the end of, of this presentation, but there is a drone survey that Rob uh, completed just before lockdown. I think it, was, it must have been the last thing that uh, we all did before uh, closing out for this little bug that we're all uh, living with at the moment. And um, Faith Bailey and an associate of hers some years ago, looking at Google Maps, showed uh, a large circular feature uh, very close to the graveyard, a big enclosure, 70, cent 70 meters in, 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 in diameter. It, it, it wasn't clearly um, recorded, it wasn't clearly, not recorded, it wasn't clearly visible in John Nichols's um, geophysical survey. Uh, now that we can see it, uh, we can go back to that data set and it does come up. But this is a 70 meter diameter um, enclosure, too big to be a ring fort, right next to Lamina gra Graveyard. And I think there must be an ecclesiastical association here that predates the high medieval. And when you, when you look at early church remains in the wider area, you see a preponderance for ecclesiastical features 
in this part of north, north of the county, as opposed to ring forts or, or secular settlement. You also see a preponderance for barrows, prehistoric burial features. And we seem to have at least two more to add to that from the geophysical survey uh, that we've completed in, the f in, in this field, in these two fields, either side of the mod. So I would say that in, in the case of Castlemore, there is an argument for suggesting that the site is perhaps constructed on former church land, old church land, and that that church land itself is constructed on perhaps ancient sacred land. And this may explain how it is that in 1181, when Raymond Le Gros wishes to have a castle built for him uh, within his new cantred of Forth, that they, ha they construct their castle here in Castle Moor. And that's all I'm going to say today. I hope I haven't talked for too long. And I don't see Linda coming in, so I must be on time. And I would like to thank the large number of people who have helped to make the project, uh, the module for the Medical Rural Assessment Project, both in the field um, and in the office, and our landowners, Mr. and Mrs. Hosey, who have been very gracious hosts and continue to be to support our work. Thank you. I'm very happy to take your questions. If anybody's out there. Thanks, me and Neil. There's lots of people out there. We have loads of participants, 50 people all together. So you've been very popular. How many? 50. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> um, and a good few questions for you um, have come in as well. Right. Some, I think, from people that you'll know. Oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, Kathy Swift has asked, um, in the 1280s and 1306, um, is there evidence for pasture, especially sheep? And did they reduce over time? So she's thinking of O'Sullivan's work on Italian merchants and moneylenders. Oh, right. It's more, it, there, is, there is a certain amount of sheep, corn, but it's more, it's more corn country than, than uh, animals, than, than uh, sheep at this stage. Um, but I'll put my hands up, Cathy, and say uh, that's Margaret's bailiwick, um, and I've been concentrating on the, the more humdrum. Um, not to say that I won't be returning to that, but it's been a while since I read the, the close detail of that. But my memory is that it's largely arable up here. Um, thanks, Neil. Another question from Henry Cruz. Um, who is wondering if you can see any similarities between the manor in uh, medieval manor in Castlemore and a place that he's sure you sure you know well, Cruistown, near <laughs> Nottingham County Meath? Um, I y y yes, I would um, I would see similarities in the sense of high medieval settlement associated with a mot, uh, much better church up in Cruistown. Um, I suppose the advantage that we have here is we've gone out and done an awful lot of geophysical surveys. So one of the, one of the, um, one of the reasons we uh, set up shop in Castle Moor and did what we did in Castle Moor, one of the reasons was to have an example or show an example of what we feel could be easily acquired anywhere else in Ireland where these deserted settlements are, are known uh, by applying a careful approach to historical resources, knowing that now, knowing that not every site will have the richness of, of contemporary written sources that Castle Moore has, but that's not to preclude the potential for good topographic survey, good field walking um, approaches, and good 
uh, application of geophysical or remote sensing surveys, all of which are non-intrusive, um, all of which can be high yielding in, 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 uh, in data. So Kristan, novel area, different landscape, Drumlin country, but again, a very strong contribution from the early medieval period uh, to explain uh, the high medieval presence there. And I would, in short, say that, yes, I do see a lot of similarity. It's amazing how one's uh, study areas keep coming round and round and round. Thank you. Um, right, lots more questions. Um, Vicky McAllister wants to know, have the Burgage plots identified in the geophysics been measured? Not in detail. Um, now, if, if uh, Andrew Bear is out there, Andrew, if you're out there, um, Andrew has been measuring the Burgess plots that we found up in Ballantover in County Ross Common, and he's actually been doing some really nice modelling, um, allowing us to perhaps uh, indicate sections of the settlement in Ballantover that may be associated with more space or less space equivalent with perhaps richer people and more impoverished people, perhaps the, the burgers versus the cottagers. I'd like to take what Andrew's done up there and apply it to um, Castle Moor, but that's, uh, that hasn't yet happened. It's on the cards. Thank you. Uh, Ruth McManus has asked, thanks to you for your very fascinating talk. Um, and says it's amazing what can be found without using a trail and wonders if you could undertake a dig, where would you like to focus on? <laughs> One of the, um, oh gosh, what would you focus on? Good Lord, I mean, uh, you're spoiled for choice. The moth is just crying out for some love and attention. Um, but the more humble side would be to take one of those uh, burgage plots and take cross sections um, and go into it. The other thing, of course, one of the other wonderful finds that we, I forgot to mention, curiously, is we found plough pebbles, two plough pebbles. So again, really nice 13th century indicator of uh, advanced ag agronomy, basically, for the period, the, the John Deere tractors of their time. There's a lot to do there. Um, I suppose the other questions I, that would interest me would be to try to trace back what was there beforehand and that curvilinear boundary in the north side of the, of the village. Of course it's crying out for an explanation. Is it somehow something early medieval snaking through into later period or is it uh, explained by topographic variables? Well, interestingly, Sharon Green sends you an observation. Mm. She says, thank you for an interesting talk, an observation rather than a question. I was very interested in the boundary on the north-northeast side of the Burgage Plots. It brought to mind the ditches that enclosed the manor of Castle Dermot that were already in filling in the 13th century and were excavated by Oksha. So. I'd love to, love to see that. That'd be great. Um, Mary Trace Flanagan has asked, um, is there any evidence of where the pre-invasion secular site associated with the Onulon was located relative to Castle Moor? Well, um, I, would, uh, I would like to suggest that there possibly is. There's a trivalent site um, two or three kilometres to the north at a now I'm going to get the pronunciation of the townland completely garbled. Bonaglafleur or something. Um, Emmett Stafford was excavating out there some years ago on supposedly a moated site. And under the moated site there was a tribal at Ringfort and under the Ringfort there was something earlier again. And it's, it's very close to the hospital site of Kilderig, which is also very close to a crossing of the, um, the Slaney at Strabo. So they're all within a kilometre of each other. And I would 
sense that that is, is, is a key area to look at. Um, there is, of course, Orpen's observation of Rath Nasillan, which is the, the, the precursor in name for what becomes Castle Moor, and in that is a, is a suggestion of a Rath. Whether it's under the, uh, the Mosh that we see our, uh, today, we, we, we simply don't know. But there's, there's, there's something big going on close by. Um, ba Bailey has a question for you, which may be more Mar Margaret's area, but um, is, there an is there any evidence as to why and when the village was abandoned? Did it survive the 1300s? Yeah, good. Yes, it does. Um, and thanks for prompting me, Faith. The, the distribution of pottery, um, early um, post-medieval pottery, it clearly attests to the presence of settlement. So it's not an immediate abandonment, it's a contraction. Like so many of these desertions, it's something, it's like, a bit like the fall of Rome. It didn't happen in overnight, it happens for over, over time. Um, but the distribution of that body of pottery is quite different to the distribution of the high medieval pottery. It's, it's much more constrained and the focus is away from the Mosh and the Bailey. So I think you do see a reduced settlement um, going into, in, into the, uh, yeah, going into probably into the 1500s. Sorry, another question. <laughs> but they're still coming in. <laughs> Great. Um, I hope everybody's had their dinner. Oh, yes. <laughs> Getting hungry now. Um, there was a question so, uh, earlier on, but it seems to have disappeared. But anyway, somebody was asking about um, what kind of geophysics you had used. Um, Gradiometry. Gradiometry. And had you used any ground penetrating radar? Yes, we did. Uh, we got John. Actually, through a grant from the Office of Public Works, uh, we were able to uh, get John back uh, to do some GPR on one of the house platforms. Um, but the data wasn't very strong. There is a data set there. And I think given that GPR has advanced significantly in the last, well, in the last five years, uh, that data set we should revisit and reprocess. Um, it may, uh, it may show things. It may, it may be interesting. And I know somebody in Massachusetts, Andrew, if you're still out there, he's got the latest gizmos and um, uh, softwares to reprocess that. Um, so, can you can you bear one more question? Have you I can bear many more questions. And um, what language was used in the borough and manorial accounts? Oh God, Latin. Latin, Irish or English? Latin. Medieval Latin. Um, and somebody was wondering, do you know how the manor in Castle Moor um, compares to the manor of Cloncurry in, in North Kildare? The manor of which? Cloncurry? Cloncurry, yeah, in North Kildare. Um, in the detail, no. Um, again, I would approach that archaeologically. Cloncurry, oh, Cloncurry really needs some decent geophysics um, because it seems to be quite discordant. I, I suppose a bit like um, Castle Moor is discordant until you apply the geophysics. Um, but Cloncurry has had the benefit of various archaeological interventions over the years. But when you plot um, those interventions, as I think we yes we did in the Dublin Region volume. There's a there's a, a page there somewhere. Uh, one of my maps is in there. there. There's you get a sense of of a presence, but you don't get a sense of cohesion. So I would suggest, given the importance of Cloncurry in in our understanding of the medieval landscape, that would be a site that would benefit from geophysical survey, large-scale, widespread geophysical survey. 
Um, well, I think that's all the questions. Um, Neil, thanks a million for that. That was really, um, really great. And thanks very much to everybody who tuned in.